Hi, my name is Steve Hagenboo. I'm a conservation biologist with Audubon, Vermont. As a woodland owner, you're probably familiar with the fact that you have um, a great variety of birds that are out using your forest land during different times of the year. And you may not be familiar with who they are or what they're doing, but we're going to give you a chance here through this module to better understand and enjoy the birds that are in your woods. Now, not only is it fun to, to just enjoy the birds that you have out there, um, understanding the birds that are in your forest actually has a, an important conservation objective as well. And the forest that you own and steward is also an important part of bird conservation. The map that we see here uh, it gives us some results of a program called the North American Breeding Bird Survey. It's one of the longest running bird survey programs that we have in this country. And what I'd like to highlight with this is the fact that up here in northern New England and Vermont, we have some of the greatest diversity of birds during the breeding season or the spring and summer months of anywhere else in the country, uh, similar to what they have in the upper Midwest. And due to the fact that a lot of Vermont is in forest land, nearly 80% of the state is covered in forest, a lot of the diversity that we see in our bird populations comes from species that utilize forest for all or part of the time that they're here with us. Now, many of the birds that you find out in your forest may be there year-round. We'll have things like black-capped chickadees, white and red-breasted nuthatches, and hairy and downy woodpeckers, and others that are year-round residents to our forest. But we also have a whole host of species that are only here in our forest during the spring and summer months, or what we call the breeding season for birds. And they spend the rest of their year in some other part of the world, perhaps Central America and South America. And these birds travel back and forth between their breeding grounds and their wintering grounds two times a year, both here in the spring and also in the fall. This map shows us some of the pathways that a lot of those birds travel as they go between their wintering and summering grounds. Here in Vermont, we're in what we call the Atlantic Flyway, and we tend to be a place where a lot of birds that are coming from Central America and South America will come up along the, the East Coast. They may stop in Vermont for a rest and then continue on their way to places farther north. But we also have a whole host of species that will end their, their migratory journey right here in the state and hope to raise the next generation of their species. Many of the songbirds that we, we will find, the migratory songbirds that we will find in our forest, are what we call neotropical migrants. And essentially what that term means is that it's a bird species who the majority of its wintering population goes south of the Tropic of Cancer, and that majority of that population returns north of the Tropic of Cancer for the summer or the breeding months. So anytime you hear the term neotropical migrants, it's a bird species that that's population fits into that scenario. Just to kind of give an example of one of the bird species that we do find in our forest land in, in the breeding season, this is a scarlet tanager. This is the male of the species for due to its, its bright coloration, which the females and most bird species generally do not have that. And we can see from this map accompanying the scarlet tanager that its, its summer or breeding range um, covers everywhere in the U.S., essentially east of the Mississippi River and, and the northern two-thirds of our country. But in the winter months, that bird is down in South America, um, and then it follows a migratory pathway uh, up along the Atlantic Flyway to return back to our forest here every year. So when we talk about these migratory species, particularly the neotropical migrants, we're talking about a scenario where the, our forest land here in Vermont really is playing part in a global bird conservation effort. Of course, once those birds return to our forest every spring and they start to make a lot of, of song and, and bright colors flitting around, the logical question is, what is it? What birds do I have out there in my forest um, that I can, can learn a little bit more about? Well, one of the things that people immediately, when they're trying to identify a bird, often jump to is, the, is they start to look for all the details. They pull their binoculars up to their face and they, they want to try to identify the colors and, and things like that. But many times it's best to start off a little bit more uh, relaxed with our, identifica our identification and to look more at, at the basic size and silhouette or shape that those birds uh, represent and not get too bogged down by the details right away. Now this, this drawing here on the left, which shows a, a landscape with a variety of birds mixed throughout it, without even seeing the coloration of any of these birds or knowing what they are, there's probably some, some silhouettes there that, that many of us are able to 
come away with a, a basic identification of what that bird is right away. For example, down in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a silhouette of a bird. I'm sure most people will recognize that as some sort of waterfowl. Perhaps, perhaps it's a mallard duck um, or something similar to that. But we didn't need to see anything other than the, than the size and the shape to come to that conclusion. In the tree there next to, the, to, the, to that waterfowl, um, on the trunk of the tree, there's a bird kind of perched there, and, and we would just see that and maybe think, well, based on the position of that bird, the way it's there, and, and the size and, and silhouette of it, maybe that's some sort of a woodpecker. Directly above it, we've got kind of the outline of, of some sort of small owl. And these are all things we don't need anything more than the, than the size and the silhouette to really narrow down what the possibility of that bird species might be. Going along with the size, it's kind of good to reference what you're looking at with some common birds that we're familiar with. So for example, if we, we saw something and it was, seemed like it was you know a little bit bigger than a house sparrow, but smaller than a robin that's out in the yard, well, it's a possibility that it's a cedar waxwing. Of course, it could be any number of other species, but just using relative sizes of birds in relation to bird species that we're familiar with can also help a lot with our identification. Once we've gotten past kind of the, that, that real introductory sort of identification, then we can start to get down to some of the more details. And this is where we're going to be looking at things like field marks and colorations that birds have. And we don't have to remember all of the, the, the specific parts of a bird in order to, to be looking at field marks, but it is good to, to kind of keep in mind some, some specific locations, particularly on the head, um, where we have eye lines and, and um, striping, throat patches, and things of that nature that, that serve as real good cue field marks to help with your identification. So as an example, looking on the right side here, at the detailed look at, at the bird on the top, which is a white-throated sparrow, you can see that there's a, a pretty complex uh, grouping of field marks that this bird has. Uh, the eye line, that dark eye line that comes right off of the, the back of the eye is a, is a good indicator, as well as that eyebrow stripe. Uh, of course, the throat patch as well for a white-throated sparrow is another key field mark characteristic that we would look for. Now, if we compare that to the, the bird below it, the ruby-crowned kinglet, we'll see that this one is much, much more simplified and not as complex in terms of field marks. And really, if we just saw the head, we'd be going off of something, in this case, which is an eye ring, which, which a number of bird species will have different eye rings, and they can be good cues, indicators, to help us get down, narrow down our identification a little bit further. But I think one of the best ways to really help with our identification is just to note the habitat that we're in because some bird species um, tend to be what we call obligates to certain habitat conditions, which essentially means that if we're not in, in the right habitat for them, we're not likely to find them. So we're going to uh, look at two bird species that if you have this sort of habitat condition on your property, and this is what we uh, often refer to as a young forest or early successional habitat is another term for it. Um, it's a type of place where maybe we had a timber harvest happen at some point, and as that forest re regrew back in, we have real high densities of woody stem vegetation, tree species, and shrubs that are growing in there, and kind of creates the habitat structure that, um, that meets the nesting needs for a variety of bird species. Another place where we might see this habitat condition is in an old field, which has been left alone for a number of years and now is starting to grow back vegetation as well. But anyway, we get to it. We do have what, what again, we re often refer to as young forest or early successional habitat. One of the bird species in terms of the neotropical migrants that are relatively common in these early successional habitats is this bird species here. Um, it's got some real good key characteristics, field marks, if you will, to it that help with the identification. So we've got eye lines and, and we've got the top of the head there to look at. Um, this is a bird called the chestnut-sided warbler. And if you look closely at it, just for, for a few moments, you can maybe determine where that, that uh, name has come from. It's got that nice chestnut colored side there right in front of the wing bar. Uh, again, this is the male of the species. The males do tend to be the more brightly colored um, of, of, the, uh, of the species compared to the female who wants to be a little bit more discreet and concealed, particularly when she's on eggs or, or on her young in the nest. But the males are gonna be the bright colored ones that often have the more characteristic field marks. The songs are also good indicators because, you know, many times we're, gonna, we're likely to hear a bird before we see it. 
And so when we start to hear songs, again, it can become a little overwhelming uh, because there's always this possibility of, you know, it could be one of 20 or 30 different birds. But if we can start to add some some words, some phrases to go along with the bird song, that can help us to uh, with our identification. So we'll take this, again, this chestnut-sided warbler is a good example. Folks in the bird community often use the phrase, please, please, please to meet you. As, the, as what this bird is singing uh, when it does its song. So let's take a listen and see if you can hear the please, please, please to meet you of the chestnut-sided warbler. Now, another bird that's relatively common within these uh, young shrubby habitat types is this bird here. This is the, the white-throated sparrow. We got to be introduced to this bird in, in the uh, artwork in the previous slide when we were looking at field marks. So here again, that white throat, that white patch there right under the bill is, is a good indicator. The black eye line that comes off the, the back of the eye and a little bit in front of it. And then that, that little bit of yellow coloration right above the eye line is another good field mark for this particular bird. In terms of the song for hearing this one, this is one that probably many people have heard of before. I call it the Song of the North Woods because we tend to find it in all different types of forested habitats from the, the lowland elevations all the way up even to the, the subalpine, the Krumholtz area where we have low, dense, shrubby vegetation near the top of Mount Mansfield or, or Camel's Hump. And when we're in those areas, uh, for any time from May down through, through August, we might be able to hear the white-throated sparrow. Now, the words that people often will use a sign with that, that uh, song that we just heard there is Poor Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Or if we're north of the border um, in Canada, then that bird says, Oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. So you can pick the, the phrase that works best for you. Um, there are some typical ones that many people will uh, use to help describe the phrases that a bird song makes. But, um, but in the end, it's whatever is going to help you to best remember it. We're now going to move out of that young forest early successional habitat and move into a more mature woodland, perhaps a, a northern hardwood forest or a mixed forest with some softwood species mixed in there. Now this forest is going to have a, a much higher canopy, so the tree heights are going to be up 60 feet or greater in many cases. And during the summer months when the leaves are out, it's relatively shaded in this forest, although there may be some small gaps in the canopy that help to get some sunlight on the ground. Um, which is an important characteristic for uh, creating some of the, the what we call forest structure elements that, that many of these birds are looking for. So out in this mature uh, forest habitat, one of the birds that we might be able to, to catch visually, again, is our friend that we met earlier, the scarlet tanager. This bird is often found fairly high up in the forest canopy. Um, it nests a little bit higher than some of the other species and often sings from high up in the canopy as well. Uh, now this bird, from a from a song standpoint, a lot of people compare it to an American robin, but an American robin with a sore throat. Take a listen. You'll note there's a little bit of a hoarseness or raspiness to it, but overall it does have more of a robin-like quality. Now as we move down through the layers of vegetation within our mature forest, we find a bird that is often going to be nesting in what we define as uh, the mid-story layer. And this is a layer of the forest from about 6 feet to 30 feet 
where we have saplings, tree saplings, and maybe some uh, understory trees like striped maple growing. Um, and this particular bird, which is our wood thrush related to the state bird hermit thrush, will often put its nest right within that, that height range of the forest. When it goes looking for its food, it's going to hop down on the forest floor many times and kick around in that leaf litter, trying to find insects, spiders, snails, which are some of its main food sources. The song for our wood thrush, which has a very heavily spotted um, spotting on its white breast there, a good, good key field mark. The song is uh, often described as this ethereal flute-like song. Um, and if you hear it, if you have heard it before, I'm sure you'll recognize it. Um, if not, it's, it's definitely one to pay close attention to. We tend to try to keep good tabs on our wood thrush populations because this is one of the species that has been showing uh, through the North American Breeding Survey and other surveys, population surveys, to be decreasing in population throughout its breeding range. So anything we can do to help enhance habitat and allow it to nest successfully and raise the next generation of its species is definitely going to be of help. And then finally down a little bit further um, in the vegetation within the forest, we get down into what we call the understory, where we have seedlings and saplings and forest shrubs growing. And this is where this bird, the black-throated blue warbler, is most likely to, to be putting its nest. Um, one of the common plants that it will often use if it, if it is found in the forest is something called hobble bush, um, which is a very dense growing, provides good cover for the nests of this particular species. It's always great when the bird... Um, name kind of describes its appearance. So in this case, black-throated blue uh, is a very good descriptor for this particular warbler species. Its song is um, not too too dramatic or fancy, but it is uh, characteristic to this species. It's a buzziness uh, that rises up in pitch. So we say it's a rising up, buzzing up to the blue sky for the black-throated blue warbler. So those are just some of the bird species that you're likely to find. Again, relatively common birds. Um, some are doing okay with their populations, and some of the, we are seeing declines in, not to the point of being rare, threatened, or endangered um, at this point, and hopefully we will work to keep it that way through good forest bird conservation.
So what can you do? Uh, you have your, your woodlot, you have your forest, and you'd like to do some things out there to help support bird populations. Well, your options for stewarding that forest resource with birds in mind really depend with, uh, on a lot to do with what's there to begin with. So as an example, if you're this landowner um, and you have some of this young, shrubby, early successional habitat forest, um, you may work to maintain it in that condition over time by periodically coming through either with a brush, uh, brush cutter, uh, brush hog if it's not too large, or if it is uh, grown larger than a brush hog can handle, you might come in and manually clear it out with a chainsaw to try to maintain that, that young, dense, shrubby structure that those bird species are looking for. If you have more of the mature forest on your property um, that is relatively dense, closed canopy and not a lot of sunlight gets on the ground, you may come in and do some, some removal of some of those trees to open some gaps in the canopy, get some sunlight on the forest floor, and try to stimulate the growth of that understory and midstory. So birds like black-throated blue warbler and wood thrush will have the vegetative structure that they're looking for for placing their nests. From some of that material that you've harvested and cut to the ground, um, you may take it out. The larger pieces is firewood, but the tops of the trees, the fine branches, fine woody material, we often like to leave that out there, create some small brush piles that wildlife, not just birds, but other wildlife too, can utilize as good cover. Um, also, they can go in there and, and feed on some of the insects and other critters that may be using those areas. More and more in Vermont, we're finding that we're getting uh, these non-native and invasive plant species uh, coming into certain areas. From a bird perspective, these are plants that often will have a fruit. Birds will eat that fruit, um, but unfortunately, it's not of the same nutritional quality in many cases that the native plants are. So as a bird's getting ready to head out on a migration, um, when they're eating these fruits, they're often leaving with uh, lower fitness levels, we call it, than if they were eating the native plants. So having a plan for how to manage and control the non-native invasive plants is another good stewardship activity. And perhaps in its place, we can plant some of the native fruits that these birds rely on to, to fatten up in migration, such as elderberries. Now, once we've been out there managing that land, or, or perhaps not, uh, no management has happened yet, we just want to get an idea of, of what birds are using it, just getting out there and what we call monitoring, getting an idea of what bird species are using your forest is, is a great way to, to start the conversation. Um, there are some organized activities you can be involved with, such as the Christmas Bird Count. This is an Audubon program that's been going on for many, many years. There's also some other things that are happening other times of the year. There's the great backyard bird count that you can do on your own property um, or join others in other locations to just make observation of birds that we're finding during different times of the year. Now, no matter what program you're, you're being involved in or if you're just going out in your own woodlot and, and doing your own monitoring, there's something called Vermont eBird, which is an online uh, data collection uh, storage area that you can submit your observations, and that is a, a great long-term way for us to track bird populations um, over time. And so we encourage anybody who does do some bird monitoring to check out Vermont eBird to submit your observations uh, to help with that long-term uh, our understanding and knowledge of birds. If you want to go for more information, get involved with some programs to help with your birding. There's certainly lots of great places you can go. Uh, nature centers, the Green Mountain Audubon Center in Huntington, our North Branch Nature Center, um, which is in Montpelier, the Birds of Vermont Museum, just down the road from the Green Mountain Audubon Center in Huntington, and the Northwood Stewardship Center, which is up in East Charleston in the Northeast Kingdom. Those are all examples, certainly not an exclusive list, but examples of, of places that often will uh, offer programs to help people learn more about birds. There are also different programs, so not necessarily physical locations to go to, but some other ways that you can get involved with um, bird conservation um, or understand how to manage your own land with birds in mind. So throughout the state, in addition to the Audubon Center, um, there are different Audubon chapters that will offer programs and bird walks to places. Vermont Coverts is a great landowner peer-to-peer -peer network that hosts some uh, workshops twice a year. Uh, there are two to three day workshops and you learn all, an awful lot of great information about how to manage your woodlot, your forest for birds and wildlife. Vermont Center for Eco Studies does a lot of great research. Uh, Audubon Vermont uses that research in some of the outreach that we do with landowners. Um, and we do offer services to private landowners that are interested in considering birds in the habitat management of their forest land. 
And then there's our technology. We all have our different devices, iPhones, iPads, whatever it might be, or a laptop computer that we use. Um, and there's many, many, many examples of different resources available to help with uh, both field guides in the field and at home to, to uh, better understand the bird life that's in your property. But there's really no substitute in the end for just getting out there and enjoying. Um, you don't need to know all the birds. In fact, I encourage you just to start with a few, one or two each year that you really start to get to know and then build upon that in subsequent years. And pretty soon before you know it, you'll have a pretty good list of the birds that are out there using your property. So get out there and happy birding.